Our scripture reading today, oh, it's not? I thought you were waving to start. Okay, our scripture reading this morning is 2 Timothy chapter 1 and 1 through 18. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom is Phagellus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we pray your blessing upon this uh, time of the service today. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide and direct, and may we be strengthened spiritually. For it's in Christ's name we pray. We, uh, we look in this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 particularly, and uh, we wish all fathers and grandfathers here a happy Father's Day. But we read in, as we said, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers and pure con with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. I'll tell you one thing. Forefathers aren't very well thought of in these last few weeks. And uh, some of you may not know, we just barely got in there in time to sing the Star Spangled Banner uh, last Sunday. Uh, his statue was torn down. Francis Scott's keys was torn down just the other day. 
and these people are tearing these down. They're so mixed up, though. Um, one guy just saw a statue and tore it down, and he found out later that it was an abolitionist statue that he tore it down. <laughs> but, you know, the thing about forefathers, and uh, when you think about the church, when you think about whether it's forefathers that were <clears throat> helped establish this work or forefathers going back all the way to to Adam and Eve going all the way back to that time and forefathers that came along the way. You know, it's a very, very important thing. Do you know that our whole social order, and we hope it will be orderly, but anyway, our whole social order is built upon the family, with Adam being the first, then Eve, and uh, the whole order. The whole order of any community being founded was built up, was built upon the concept of the family. You had to have where you had groups of people that lived together, and they would form, you know, say some body, you know, for uh, legislation and, and so on. But I think we can rejoice in this and, and see this plainly brought brought out in Scripture. Uh, the social order, um, which is to rule in heaven, only uh, one glimpse has been disclosed. The uh, structural unit of the New Jerusalem is spoken of as of human life on earth. It's not the individual, but it's the family. It's the family. And I think when we grasp that, that we understand why all these attacks are being made upon the family and there's an attempt to destroy it because it's the whole foundation uh, throughout the world. The family unit uh, is built on that when people live to sit together. I mean, in Bala, they have a city or a county council there in a in their in their county. They have uh, things like that, but that's the way it's been throughout history, where uh, communities who join together, or or, or it would be a collection of families that join together, or whether it be you know uh, as we go up the scale, um, as more and more people were around and, and units were formed. It was all built upon the family. And that's why uh, we have here about the divineness of the family bond, because it was all set upon that. And, and their roles, especially the role that Adam had in his responsibility. We see a, another verse in Psalm 68, verse 6. Psalm 68, and verse 6. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. But that, that phrase, he setteth the solitary in families. Families were the basic building unit for our culture. It was the basic building unit uh, for, for any nation, really, that comes together because there's families. And, uh, and so there would be... You know, a mother, a father, and uh, it's part of the st structural unit and the children. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, we know that, as we said, that the structural unit uh, of the New Jerusalem, uh, as of a human life on earth, is not the individual, but it's the family. And, uh, and so, as he says, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. Every family in heaven and earth is named. You ought to know that in, in that incomparable number of angels which have kept their first estate and uh, descending from no common head and unbound by any sort of ties by flesh and blood, uh, they rank themselves in households. And it's an important part. But I think that's part of the reason we see so much destruction. I tell you what, I'm I'm grieved when I hear some of the things that are said, and I'm not you know just knocking uh, young people, you know nothing like that. And uh, but where some of the things that are said in recent things that we've seen, from those who are out demonstrating or out setting a car on fire or or what it, whatever they're doing and various places all, all around the world. It's a, it's a grievous thing to see that so many of them are, are very young people 
that are a part of that destruction. I just think it's a very, very sad thing. And uh, But still, the family was a basic building unit for society. It was the basic building unit in our nation. It was a basic building unit all around the world. And uh, so in the Father's house, we are told, are many mansions and uh, in, in which the family bond remains unchanged. It remains unchanged. In my Father's house are many mansions. And uh, the Father of uh, from the Father, every family in heaven and earth is named. We can't, in English speech, uh, reproduce the thought and expression uh, from that concept, but we know that it keeps, it's a part of the building block for the whole world. I think I mentioned this several years back, but a, a friend of ours uh, who had been at Faith Seminary, I think he had. He, he had graduated from there just a little while before I started, and he had a church there in the Philadelphia area that was only a, a few a few blocks from the from the seminary, and so people went there. But he uh, his a uh, doctoral thesis that he had whatever uh, doctoral place wherever he got his doctor's degree, um, he wrote it on about the family being the basic building unit in a culture and how it affects whether and God's law is a basic building unit whether it's like laws or or you know that people need to obey to have a functioning society a functioning uh, city a functioning uh, community we want to think about the uh, divineness and the far-reaching effect or far-reaching power of this bond, of a family bond. And you th think about that for a moment. It's just overwhelming, really. And uh, uh, that basic building unit. And that basic building unit needs to be strengthened. We we ought to be praying for every family in our church. I hope we all do that. We ought to pray for every family, especially when there's children at home, and, and pray, pray for them, too. And... Uh, that it's a part of the building unit, and it's a part of the building unit for the church also is based upon the family. And um, and we think about the uh, vitality of the congregation. This um, comes a lot from the vitality of the, the family. And uh, uh, speaking of vitality, I, uh, I couldn't help but remember, I don't know if I'd use the word vitality, the liveliness that comes from a family. And surely you won't mind me saying this about Chris, but you didn't ever want him to be up here, you know, taking part in a program or something, and be the guy holding the microphone. He had a way. And he, what was he said one time? He said, I wish I could get paid just to shout. <laughs> And, uh, but vitality is too mild a word to really use, extreme vitality or whatever. But, but it is. It's a, the uh, vitality of a church, you know, is measured by its people. And, uh, and where the scripture says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, what, what will we do if that foundation is destroyed? And it seems to me that it can, more and more destroyed. It's getting more and more destroyed. I remember hearing a, I don't know if it's on a radio talk show or something. There's a guy that called in and uh, he was talking about, he said he's finding it more and more and more. Here he pays for his daughter's college education and he used the term 40000 a year. And he said, all I get back is someone who tears down everything I believe in. That's what I'm paying $40,000 a year for, from what she gets at her university. And there are people who are obviously making this attempt to destroy the foundations. What can the righteous do? And a part of that is that the righteous need to do a lot before it gets torn down and, uh, and to strengthen it. And uh, 
when a man can, he ought to thank God for his forefathers. And uh, I never had thought about that, but you just start with the list. I mean, I wouldn't say turn to all the all the begat passages, you know, in the Old Testament, you know, and start going through those names and especially ones that you might recognize. But they're part of our forefathers. Moses, Abraham, Noah, Adam, all these are part of our forefathers. And we need to thank them for how God used them and God uh, law spread uh, by use of these forefathers and by the prophets and, and others whom God had raised up. And those were building blocks uh, for our nation. They were building blocks uh, throughout the world. And they were building blocks uh, that strengthened homes and strengthened the family circle. And, and it was just, a, I'm not talking about the magazine either. But anyway, um, they, uh, it, it strengthened it. And so, but what, what will we do? What can the righteous do? If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I think some of the most um, vital things just to be reminded is we thank God for our forefathers. We thank God for our forefathers. That's not a popular thing these days, especially for our forefathers that were a, a part of part of this nation and part of its founding. When a man can, he ought to thank God, as we said, for his forefathers. We think about an infant that's born today, but time passes quickly. And he should, he or she, needs to be reminded about their forefathers that we would be thankful. We need to be reminded that we belong to a family, and the character of the family may encourage or it may weaken uh, what the efforts are being made to have godly children. The child didn't choose his parents, they were chosen without his knowledge or consent. And yet he's born. He's linked to circumstances that hopefully will lift him up. But if anything that we think of in, in regard to this, we ought to think and remember how important it is to pray for young people. Pray for families that you know. And pray, it may be relatives of yours or grandchildren of yours or whatever, but you, you pray for them, you pray for them, you pray for them. And... Uh, I was uh, trying to, I know Shirley had told me that Arnie's over at Shannon's house doing some work over there at the house. And uh, I remember years and years ago when he went over there to build, and all the kids were a lot smaller then. And uh, they were always in there wanting to help their grandpa, you know, do it, building. I think that's, uh, that's help with quotes around it. And, uh, but anyway, now the the older ones now and they're they're bigger of course and they really are helping him over there right now so that's good but i think you know these reminders that come along our way and i know sometimes in god's providence maybe it's not a situation that lent itself uh, to uh, thanks perhaps uh, maybe it was a very difficult time and our whole life it's bound up in this family unit that, of which the scriptures speak. We think that Jesus, we read of his birth, and he was born into poverty, and his social ranking, he was a son of a carpenter. He worked with his hands, and uh, so that was a word. And, uh, and, and that was very derogatory in the minds of some people when Jesus began his ministry, and they said, is not this a carpenter's son? How can we expect, or can anything good come out of Nazareth? Some, some of you may think of cities, you could use those words and just change the name of the city or wherever it is. Mm -hmm. But can anything good? And those are circumstances into which he was born and certainly under the plan of God. And uh, the traditions of a of a godly family build up a heritage that is wonderful to look at. And I've mentioned about the blizzard 
family uh, down in Florida. I don't know how many, was it 30 something grandchildren or great grandchildren? Great grandchildren. Huh? Great grandchildren. Great grandchildren. Close to 40. Close to 40. <laughs> All serving the Lord. All help and enjoying things in church and, uh, and and great kids and now some of the blizzards Reverend Blizzard's son who's a pastor in Lakeland he's getting on up there like 20 grandchildren you know and so on and uh, but anyway and you see this growth that's there and we understand how it is then that the family is a basic building unit and we pray for these people. We we rejoice in them, and uh, the the bond that creates uh, and per perpetuates the family is the marriage bond. And we need to strengthen marriage. That institution is of divine origin, and its uh, sanctity and directly has an effect upon the fruit of Christianity. And we ought to remember that in our prayers. And uh, I know someone who thinks they're married and uh, it's just uh, say we just live together for so long, seven years, and they say it's a legal marriage. It'll never be a legal marriage in this church. The this government doesn't set what our standards are for marriage. And uh, I don't know of a person, any of our ministers in the church, that would give recognition to that sort of thing. It's not that. The other day I had heard about someone that got married. And uh, they went down to judge and got a piece of paper. We're married. We're married. There's more to that and a greater role that the church needs to play and to encourage and to pray for those who are married. And uh, marriage is more than just some human contract or some, it's a, it's a divine institution. It belongs to the race of mankind from the very day of, cre uh, of the creation of Adam and Eve. Marriage belongs there. He created them male and female. He made one, one wife and one husband. And, um, and as the scripture says, and Malachi says, did not he make one yet? Had he the residue of the spirit? And wherefore one that he might seek a godly seed. That meant that it would, that it would spread, that it would be strengthened and it would, you know, be a blessing. But I just think it's overwhelming to think that what we have in our hands was the very foundation for eventually communities, well, families, communities, towns, cities, villages, counties, states, countries, throughout the world. Now, in some of those places, you know, they, they maybe don't recognize the biblical thing, but that's where it started. That's where it started. And so uh, when we think about, as it asks, you know, about our forefathers, do we, uh, are we reminded of them? and do, do we follow that? I don't think that we ever recognize the debt of happy homes, the debt that we have to, to Christianity, the debt that we have to our Heavenly Father the debt we have from His Word, the, the debt we have just in, in relationship to the Ten Commandments. We had a couple stop out here the other evening and, and uh, commenting on that. We were talking to him. And he, said, he said, I think I like this sign better than any of the others I've seen because it's got, it's got law and grace on the same sign. The Ten Commandments and where it says the law is our schoolmaster the grace to bring us to Christ. You know, and we think about that. We had a nice visit with him. But anyway, 
we um, certainly should be much in prayer. And I think if the homes were strengthened, I think if family life were brought more into accord with God's holy and infallible word, that, uh, that things would be much different in our nation be much much different so we need to pray for that we um, we think about in the in the Roman world Paul had written these words here in in Timothy in the day when uh, Caesar the reign of Caesar was when Jesus was born he had been born, divorced one wife after another, and then quickly divorced a young Livia from her husband, Augustus, it says, to whom she had born one child and was about to bear another. And he just took her to be his own wife, took her away from the other man. And the fellow writes, the domestic life of Caesar, and of the Caesar in whose reign Paul was writing was simply infamous. And uh, so we see this destruction that comes and the things that we see happening today, it's infamous the way we see what's being done in regard to the family and seeing what's being done in regard to the teaching of children in public school. And obviously, no biblical foundation at all. And uh, I, uh, you know, I recognize that when, when I was in school, you know, I remember when the story. But anyway... Uh, some of the kids, everybody had to read, you know, if, if it's a home, homeroom class, you know, always had Bible read, always had Bible read. And, uh, and so some of them, you know, looked like they're about very, very little interest at all. But most of them, they, they sounded well enough, you know, even reading from the King James Bible, you know, so we were getting some education in English that way. But anyway, um, you know, and they would read that. And I, I look back on those times and, and um, as an important part of, of God using that in the lives maybe of some other kids there that were in my class or something along the way. And, and, uh, and the encouragement that we received from home about being in church. And uh, we were there for everything on Sunday. We'd be there on Wednesday night. I remember one guy with Campus Crusade said he would always, when they were having prayer time, he said after a while you'd always know so-and-so was going to pray next, and they'd always pray about the same thing. So being a feisty kid that he was, when he knew it was about turn for this other person to pray, he would start praying. He'd pray the same prayer. <laughs> and those people never were able to pick up you know, on that. But uh, the Lord used him, and uh, I remember meeting him at the, at the University of Tennessee. You think about in the scriptures where it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Where it says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Man, a writer about this said, They were the rays of a new sun. The seeds of a new life. They regenerated, they regenerated the family. They saved society. They did. God's Word helped to do that. We can be thankful for that. But we just pray for revival today. We pray that there might be a great moving of God's Spirit and that we would see a great cause to rejoice. We need it. We need it desperately. We need to have this uh, whole basis of the family, beginning with Adam and Eve, to, to the current time. It's been based upon what was in God's Word. Those rules and laws that were picked up and made a part of society, and they were a part of that. And so we rejoice. We rejoice in that. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful, Lord, for all that your word teaches. We're thankful for the history of the family. 
We're thankful that the family was established as a part of creation. And our father, we're thankful that there's still some influence throughout society. It was a building block. But our father, we pray that it will not be destroyed. That we would speak that we would stand for the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, that we would pray for those families with which we're familiar and others too, and that we would give you the praise. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>